Martin is the CEO of Brooklyn Boulder. Um, he previously had been uh, a, a pivotal person in and the development of uh, other health companies like Health Rages, also Reflection Health. Uh, I can say from experience, Martin is an incredible design leader, an innovator, and, uh, and a great human uh, being. And uh, it's a pleasure to have Martin here to, to talk about uh, some of the work that he's been doing over at Rick and Boulder that I've had a sneak preview in and um, and it blows my mind. So I'm, I'm super excited about this. And Martin, you want to talk to us about uh, designing a flow machine? Yeah, absolutely. <clears throat> uh, Dustin, can you just let me know you can see my screen? Sorry, good. Yep, we're great. All right, fabulous. Okay, well, appreciate the intro. This is a kind of a homecoming for me. I started out in digital health, had the opportunity to work with you, Dustin, as well as Ravi, who presented earlier. Um, and then I, I had another kind of fortuitous opportunity to take that skill set into the world of, I guess, fitness or recreation around a, a long term interest of mine, rock climbing. So I think the rock climbing is not necessarily specific to people in the audience, but certainly some of the lessons applied from behavior change and really pushing the envelope and saying, can we boost adherence and, and enjoyment in something that is inherently very physically challenging? And that's sort of core of our business model, and we'll go through that. But that is a pure play view on, I think, pushing the bounds and behavior change in a specific area that has lessons that are broadly addressable. So I'll get right into it. Uh, so you may know rock climbing, a lot of exposure for Alex Honnold in Free Solo. You can see him at the top winning an Academy Award at, in the bottom meeting with one of our members and giving a talk in one of our facilities. This was a real breakthrough for our activity, our sport. And we'll also be including the Olympics for the first time this year as well. So it's a, it's a really exciting time to be in this sub niche of the industry. Um, this is a shot of one of our facilities in Somerville. So near the HXD land, uh, it, they're massive. They're like the size of a Home Depot. They have thousands and thousands of people in them over the course of a week. And the scale for people who are not exposed, don't even know this thing exists. The scale is pretty significant. So we have these in Boston, in New York, in Chicago, and soon to be in DC, expanding rapidly. The appetite nationally for this is just exploding. Uh, and, and personally, I'm excited to be in, in that and that's all well-timed, but I think it creates a lot of opportunity for innovation. And that's what I'm gonna talk about today. So our business model is essentially reliant on exposing people to the sport. About a third of the people that come in have never rock climbed before. At any one time, more than half of the people that are in our gyms are beginners. We have some advanced and very little expert. To become an expert takes a tremendous amount of time. I would not consider myself to be an expert. The lifetime value, because it is a business, of a beginner, you could think of that as X, and X is in the thousands, and advanced is 2X. Expert is not much more than that. So our business relies fundamentally on bringing people into the sport, exposing them and having them fall in love with the sport, one way to think about that is the business model is to hook people on climbing, both the sport and the lifestyle. We've exposed over a million people in the 12 years that we've been in business. And there are barriers to our success, and this gets into the design criteria. Many people do not enjoy their initial experiences climbing. And I would say this is very similar to initial experiences in many areas of behavior change, especially around physicality. So the feeling of not being fit enough to enjoy the activity specific to ours, but also addressable in other areas is people are scared, scared of heights specifically, uh, and that they don't have a friend to accompany them. So you can think of lack of social support networks. That's a problem that plagues behavior change in many areas in healthcare. So what are we doing about that? Well, first I took a step back. What do we want people to experience? We want people to experience flow. And I mean that as uh, to be fully immersed in an activity that's challenging, but that they find at the same time to be pleasurable, sort of like out of your head would be a very uh, general way to term that. We want people to have an experience of success. That's important to the, them wanting to come back. We want people to, some people do want to be scared and some people do not. And being scared is a, is a continuum. So be exactly as scared as you want to be, which might be not at all. We want people to leave with a project. And what we say in climbing vernacular, a project is a climb that you are not able to accomplish but you believe with more attempts that you would be able to. So it's not uh, free soloing LCAP. It'd be saying, I fell once or twice on this, 
but I think if I tried it a few more times, I would get it. And so that's one of the things that draws people back, kind of unfinished business kind of idea. And then to make a new friend or to enhance existing relationships, I'm very passionate about this. If you read long ago, the book Bowling Alone, we have an epidemic of loneliness in society. It is absolutely uh, an issue in population health. I saw it um, both on Health Rages and Reflection Health. And to the extent that we can help people become fitter and feel like they have strong, stronger social support networks, that's good for the business, but it's absolutely beneficial for society. So it's an area that I'm very passionate about. So what's our criteria for success here? We wanna personalize the challenge to the individual. You've heard about personalization a lot, including in this conference. We want social support and collaboration. And very specific to my industry, I wanna be able to vary height because that's one way that I can control for fear. Now, I see a pattern and this is, you'll see this in a lot of places. I could put 15 examples here. This is one of the things that drew me from digital health to this outdoor sports world. Uh, there's a pattern in how these sports become digitized and go indoors. You could apply this to rowing, to boxing. There's an enormous number that fit exactly into this. You could slot mirror or tonal some of the home exercise into the same paradigm. So you start with something that's outdoors, that's a sport, let's say cycling. Then it comes inside. It's stripped of a lot of the experience at first. It's the most general movement. It's highly repetitive, likely boring. And then over time, they add experience to that, usually mediated by some kind of sensor or biometric that allows for a feedback loop. And so they up the experience value, whether it's through entertainment, like watching somebody lead a class, like a spinning class, or whether it's digitizing, say, an entire golf course. Uh, in the example of boxing, it would be boxing in a ring with somebody else. Then it goes to hitting a heavy bag, which is um, not tremendously exciting and physically demanding. And now there's AI boxing bags that on hard mode, I'm not even able to make contact with. They're, they're so effective. So we see a progression. Uh, key to the progression in a lot of areas is the inclusion of biometrics to measure the individual um, and also to provide feedback loops so that you can see your activity as it results in the immersive experience. And so my goal here was to apply a similar concept to climbing, to say that the evolution of climbing was to climb outside, then to try to replicate the same movement outside, inside. In, in the middle, you can see basically the current state of the industry. And there's a little allusion here to where we're headed on the right, which is a fully digitized climbing experience. So before I get into that, where I think there is a lot of general addressability is the models that we applied. Some of these you've seen before, but I wanna talk about how we co-mingled them to get to product market fit very rapidly. So this model of flow, I, I absolutely love this model. You know, arguably it's a little bit simplistic, but there's just a heck of a lot of good stuff here. Robbie also shared a model around emotion. I think these work very well together. So I'm okay with people being in arousal. I'd like them in flow as they get better, um, it, assuming things don't get harder, they're more likely to be in control. This spectrum, that's good. I can make happy users. I can have successful products. I can run a successful company moving through these areas. I do not want to be in anxiety or worry. And that's the current state for a lot of beginners is they end up in this area. I don't want that. And obviously I don't want these, these bottom areas, but I can run them up. Just running up the stimulation kind of keeps you out of this bottom area. Not being able to titrate challenge to ability is where you get stuck in this anxiety worry area. And that's just fundamentally bad for business. So in my world, you think of, a, of just a for-profit business, bad for business. Anybody who's creating health, they want change, whether you work for a payer, uh, an institution, a startup, you really don't want people in that zone because that's a zone where people are gonna move away from the discomfort and they're not likely to stay with your product or service. So to the extent that we can game our way into being in this upper right area, all the better. So this is one. Another, that's a commingling of concepts you've probably seen before. I think if you were to remember one thing, generally uh, applicable to your own life, I'll move through how I think these things work together in the importance of them both in, in business and in personal life. I'm sure you've seen the FOG behavior model, the general concept being high motivation, high ability, and to be triggered gets you the behavior, hot triggers in the path of motivated people. Unique to our, our area, and I think others will encounter this as well, so imagine somebody who comes in relatively motivated to try rock climbing. Their ability is low. 
as they move through the activity, because their body is not, has not been habituated, it's not compensated for the unique demands of the activity, their ability actually becomes lower. Their forearms start to hurt, their grip starts to fail. So their motivation goes down as they're becoming more frustrated and their ability goes lower. So they're likely to end their first experience, which they've maybe paid in the neighborhood of 40 to $50 for, in the bottom left, low motivation, low ability. And if you look at that straight line to the star, that's exactly where you do not want people to be. Now, let me talk to you about why that's a real problem. Because if you build on the work of Kahneman, then you see Kahneman and Fredrickson, this peak end rule says that people basically remember the peak of an experience and the end of ex an experience. This again is tremendously impactful to designing products or services. If you go to yoga, Shavasana at the end, and the really smart instructors walk around and maybe put some kind of essential oil on your forehead, they're making sure that you remember the end as pleasurable because you're more likely to return. So what happens if at the end you're frustrated, you cannot complete the behaviors you thought you could do, like climb to the top of the wall? Now, your memory of this is as a negative experience, right? So you remember maybe being really scared the time that there was a lot of stimulus applied, and maybe you remember at the end being very frustrated. So scared and frustrated, and I think Robbie referenced some of this around the, uh, the chatbot, that's not a good recipe for adherence. There are ways we can game that. And I'll give an example of how we sort of learn from research here. So if Dan O'Reilly, uh, you know him, uh, what's his book? Predictably Irrational is one that, that's very well known. So they did a really interesting study, ramping down intensity over time, over the course of an exercise, increases the remembered and, fo uh, and forecasted pleasure. So if the intensity goes down over time, people remember it as more pleasurable and they're more likely to return. That's more kind of evidence about this peak end rule. So in the way that the prior art, the current state of affairs is that people leave potentially frustrated and unable to continue. That is the opposite of where the research is telling us we wanna go. So these were, these models in conjunction help to really impact the thinking and to understand the opportunity. So I'm gonna show at the risk of potential technical failure. I'm gonna show you where we ended up. So this is a fully articulating board. I can adjust the angle. I can control it with an iPad. It can be animated. It can run physical classes, like you can imagine group fitness. People can pair up together. Well, this is part of that social support, so helping people um, make friends or, or interact with their friends. And in the woman on the right you're seeing is one of the world's best rock climbers, Sasha DeJulian. This can push her abilities to the max, but also I can control and ensure that uh, sort of it's more generally addressable to the layman. And so this is giving me tremendous ability. Let me pull this back in. There we go with the problems. All right, so this is giving me tremendous ability to have control of the experience. That's on an articulating board that's run by hydraulics. We combine those together for a group fitness experience. And I'm gonna show you 10 seconds of uh, the, the piece of this that I'm the most excited about, where we have a lot of protected IP and where I think the sport is gonna be changed forever. So he grabs a hold and I illuminate a next action. So you can think of this as like, if this, then that. This allows me to customize routes to somebody as they're moving. So I can make 60 or 80 foot tall routes that progressively change to make sure that you stay in flow. So whereas previously people would fail, they would not be able to continue. In this paradigm, I can continually adapt all aspects of the experience in real time based on things like how much force I can measure you're outputting, the path that you choose, whether you failed previously. And so this ecosystem that we've created allows an individual on their phone to connect to a board or a wall. The, the board knows who they are. It knows their past successes and failures. It can suggest climbs from a library and they can choose and select those either on their phone or on an iPad. So what we've done effectively is we have either created a group fitness paradigm where I can link many of these boards together to run fully synced classes where the angle of the board is specific to someone's ability, but many people can have the same experience, like you could think of spinning, where you're adjusting uh, the resistance on the bike. So that's a completely new paradigm in our world 
which is to say, how do you create group fitness with the movement, the enjoyment, and the, and the physical benefits of climbing, but in a way that's scalable and, um, and can be adjusted to the needs and abilities of an individual. The other paradigm is uh, in our general facilities to create entire walls that are driven off of these iPads where people can have individual experiences or they can have experiences synced up to one another. There's also benefits that are very specific to our world, like everything is mirrored so that people don't create imbalances in their bodies, which is a, a challenge when uh, like going outside or in the traditional rock climbing world where you might unknowingly favor a certain type of movement and build pretty significant imbalances in your body because the stressors are enormous. And so the body will respond to that. But if it's not done in a balanced way, like if you did only bicep curls on one arm, you'd, uh, you'd end up looking and moving in a sort of bizarre way over time. The other thing that's very specific to our industry, but I think is, is also important is there are unknowns, there are norms within the space, like whose turn is it? So there are queuing problems that for people that are new, if you don't understand the unspoken norms of the gym, they become somewhat stressful. So these like social stressors, like if I'm at a 10K, where do I stand at the starting line? Um, what, what is the norm in a, in a traditional gym or a yoga studio? Though that signaling is really, really important to having people be comfortable and enjoy their experience. So as much as possible, we try to digitize and therefore have greater control of things like queuing to take out all of the unknowns, the potential negative social interactions where people feel uncomfortable. Uh, one of my great passions is surfing. And this is an area where if I were to solve the queuing problem, I would make the sport tremendously more enjoyable and accessible because that's where a lot of the friction and uh, interpersonal unhappiness lies. So over time, and this is a low example, this is called bouldering where the walls are about 12 feet tall, but over time we'll move to fully digital gyms. They'll include climbs as high as 60 feet. I'm, I'm also piloting and pretty excited about other things that involve augmented reality in ways that we could feel like Alex Honnold without the, the risk of death associated. Uh, that's, that's in time, but this is the underlying technology to basically say we've digitized that which was fundamentally analog to begin with. And it's a palette that allows us to do a lot of design in service of behavior change, the behavior that we want is adherence to this new sport activity, which at a population level has tremendous health benefits. We're talking about tens and hundreds of thousands of people. So it's a pretty significant intervention when you think about it at scale. Uh, but for the business model, it also means success and profit. The, so I would say as takeaways, I don't love the word gamifying, but I think it could be used appropriately here. What I'd like for people to think about is how do you gamify everyday objects and activities? because it is a formula. So this is overly simplistic. The formula has more components, but a way to think about it, you capture your inputs and the outputs. So my input, some of the, the IP here, is that I know if you've held a hold. My outputs are things like lighting up holds, but because I have the inputs and the outputs, like when Atari transformed the television because it added inputs, now I have the ability to make feedback loops. Now I have the core of what I need for a game. Now I can connect those inputs and outputs to a game engine, which are ubiquitous now. There's lots of developers. The cost to develop games is going much lower because these engines are so powerful, things like Unreal and Unity. It means that almost anything, once I digitize it to capture inputs and outputs, I can turn that into a game, a component of which is to keep score, uh, but it's so much more than that. It's the immersiveness and the interactiveness, the ability to put somebody into flow. So as a very specific example, it's fun. Uh, it's interesting, I guess, at a certain level to count how many flights of stairs somebody has gone up or down. But if you had inputs and outputs on it, you could make the act of climbing stairs fun. You could say things like, okay, we're going to do every other stair. You could do it in tempo, on beat to a metronome. You could vary based on their physiological response, heart rate, things like that, to ensure that somebody is having an enjoyable time, immersed in the activity, not being pushed too far, but also getting just enough exercise. And that's just the example of climbing a staircase. So I'm using an example of rock climbing, but think of it as we took something that was fully analog, we captured the inputs and the outputs, and that gave us a palette that we could use to design all sorts of activities 
games, personalization, competition, competition even across facilities or even across the world, and, and, and enormous benefits, not just for the user, but also for the cost structure, because now I can create rock climbs by tapping on an iPad as opposed to cranking uh, bolts into the wall. Just a, an unlock of enormous proportions simply by applying the lens of how could I capture inputs and outputs and then think of those as the fundamental components of creating a game. So how do we determine what we want to gamify? Here's a very simple explanation. You exert, observe user behavior during analog or sort of non-digital use, maybe like any kind of dumb object, like think of a staircase. You target the most enjoyable parts, and then you work to fix the most frustrating parts. So if you, if you made a continuum here, there are things people really like about an activity, and there's things they really don't like. In our world, they like being in flow, and they don't like feeling like they were unable to make progress, or they're so sore now after five minutes of activity that they just spent $50 or $10 a minute in a literal sense, and, and now there's no more for them to do. So when you think about this, it's find something that a lot of people are already doing, identify what they like about it, what they don't like about it, and then think about what input or output could you capture that would allow you to perfectly titrate and personalize in nearly or absolutely real time to make that thing more enjoyable and less frustrating. And, and the last thing I would say is the lens of social interaction on all of these things, how can technology assist with making things that are maybe awkward, maybe um, cause people to be a little bit anxious? How could we eliminate or significantly mitigate those concerns? We're gonna get huge benefits from that area. And that's not necessarily an area that people are always gonna be looking at top of mind. So this is taking some of the learnings from this world, from HXD, from healthcare experience in general, taking it outside of healthcare, applying it to a completely different industry, and then bringing it back, because I think there's, there's so much broad value here in looking at this as a pure play. How do you get somebody to do something that is inherently very challenging, enjoy it, and then want to come back for more? That's what I got. Thank you. Ooh. Oh man, Martin, that is awesome. Awesome. When did we start working together? Like 2010, 2011 or something? It yeah, you let me cut my teeth with you spending six months with you in the office. <laughs> I will never forget it. Uh, it is just so amazing to see, um, you know, just to see the evolution and the things that you've been able to do from, from company to company and, and where, you, where you are now. It's awesome. It's awesome, man. This is super, super, super exciting. Um, mind blowing. Uh, there is a question, um, which I think is a cool question about um, one, like, how did you prototype this stuff and, and test it? And particularly, like, what, what did you learn from, from failures and challenges throughout that process? Can you tell us a little bit, um, you know, what that was like and particularly like hey what's not working and, and what do you do yeah it? yeah so um so I, we were able to build on some prior art it we ended up having to build our own computer systems and controllers and everything but um there were already people looking at lighting up the back of holds and so there was already something to say okay there's some resonance here there's some product market fit but that lacks the ability to understand what's been held and so so to me that was like oh you have outputs but not inputs now it's time to descend with this kind of mentality on the problem space. Um, by looking at it the whole time as a palette, so in, in working with Ravi and in working with you, building the tools for someone else to create the right game has always been my perspective. I don't consider myself like a gifted game designer in the same way that I would rather be the guy that made the Xbox than made the game that goes on the Xbox. Because once you've made the Xbox, somebody else will make the game. And so, that's, that's really helped us not get frustrated because the observed use when we started exposing it to people, people wanted to like do yoga on it. People wanted to have races. They wanted to do things that I had, they we're not thinking about at all. So then that became like not frustrating, like, oh man, they're not using it the way they're supposed to. It was like, all I'm trying to do is make a tool set to put out to the world, you know, if, if everything, if I give you a hammer, maybe everything becomes a nail kind of thing. Um, 
we have one challenge right now, which I didn't anticipate, which is static electricity that people create when they walk across the climbing pads as, as a potential risk to, to frying our boards. So like, you know, we've encountered all these bizarre things just living in the real world, so to speak. But my mentality about all of this is create the palette, observe the behavior, and then bring on more talented people to figure out exactly what the right, um, the right mix of experience is. And so that I think has made it relatively frictionless and, and has allowed me to feel successful in the organization to feel successful at every turn because we weren't saying we made a game people like it, don't like the game. We were thinking the whole time we're making a game console and over time we will, people will get better and better about making games on it. Awesome. Yeah. You are a Sherpa, my friend, you are full of wisdom. There's much to unpack in that presentation. Uh, and I particularly appreciate you coming on board, um, you know, later in the process, uh, to the, to the conference. Um, we are up and out of time. Folks with questions, reach out to all of these uh, well-esteemed speakers. They've got so much to share um, that can make all of our work so much better. Uh, thank you, Martin. Thank you, one and all, Ravi, Camille, Eli. It's been a pleasure every year. I say like, oh, it's even better, uh, it, but it's true. This was um, a, a true pleasure and, and my brain is and heart are full. So thank you, everyone. Everyone, uh, enjoy the rest of the conference, and we'll all see you around. Cheers.